So we're back. We're live. This is the Cutting Edge Energy 808, the Cutting Edge, and I'm here going solo uh, without my dear friend uh, Jay Fidel. And I'm just so pleased, so very pleased to be with uh, Henry Curtis, Life of the Land, who comes uh, right out of uh, the cauldron or the <laughs> sauna, whatever metaphor uh, you're good with, Henry. Choose your own uh, after a count of four days and a skosh of uh, evidentiary hearings before the Public Utilities Commission considering the power purchase agreement, which has been, gosh, talk about a long saga, has been uh, before the state, before the commission in one form or another for a very long time. So uh, that wrapped up today. I watched a fair amount of it. I wasn't start to finish, of course, like you were being an intervener in the docket. And for, for uh, number one, congratulations for you and your team making it through. I watched your closing, Kat's closing earlier today. I watched all the closings because I, I, that's kind of interesting to see where hours and hours and hours of summary uh, or hours of testimony, hours of cross, hours of IRs gets boiled down to 10 minutes. You each had 10 minutes to do a closing. So uh, thank you so much, Henry, for, for being with me today and being with us. So my, how are you feeling, man? I guess that's, that's my first question. How are you feeling? I, I'm feeling a breath of relief, release that it's over. Um, although it, it was really important to be in and it was really important to prepare for, but just thankfully, it's over now, and we can move on to the next exciting phase of spending three weeks combing through the record to make our final briefs. So why don't you just take us through uh, what the last steps are here in the weeks and uh, months to come? What, what, can, uh, what can we expect? First, the PUC will look over the video and make sure that the video that we're all working off of is sort of the final approved video. That will be separate from the YouTube version. Uh, so this will be the official one that we can actually cite. Um, the date it was uh, taped, the time, the witness, et cetera, for using, for building our uh, final argument. It's important to recognize that the brief just is based on all the facts throughout the case. And whether one cites the video recording or some other document, it's all part of the record. So first the PUC will um, make an official version of the tape approved it, and that will probably be in a couple days. And then the five sides will each have three weeks to write a final brief and submit it to the commission. And then the commission will have as much time as is needed to, to write their final decision, sorry, decision. With Jay Griffin being up at the end of June, it's likely the decision will come out in May, possibly early June. Um, and then that's that. So what, what, if anything, surprised you in the course of these uh, four days in, in a skosh as far as, I mean, there was, of course, tremendous preparation on the part of all parties, I have to believe. And... I mean, again, I, I didn't watch it from start to finish, but I caught a lot of pretty big chunks of it. Uh, so I'm, I'm really curious to hear what, if anything, kind of surprised you after all of the preparation, all the anticipation that you had. What surprised me the most is that the Huhonua team of lawyers, in looking at the Supreme Court decision, could not understand the word A and D. We appealed on three issues, one, greenhouse gases, two, clean and healthful environment, and three, making us an, a full party instead of a participant. The Supreme Court very carefully in the first two pages of their decision said, we are upholding life of land on issue one and issue two, but not issue three. So it's one and two. But who who knew has insisted it's only one. They have said they have given lip service to our right to a clean and helpful environment, but assumed that was the same thing as greenhouse gases. They have assumed that all other environmental issues are off the table, which is absurd. 
So when, correct me if I'm wrong here, and I don't have the language right in front of me, when there was the decision in 2020, which uh, effectively stopped the decision on the part of the commission uh, to reverse the 2017 decision under uh, Randy, Randy Awase, that was that approved the PPA, right? And then right. subsequently, several years later, under Jay Griffin, the previous approval to move forward under that PPA power purchase agreement was reversed by under, under the commission under Jay and his team. And that was appealed by the uh, by Hujo Noah and the parties. And the Supreme Court ruled, in fact, that there should be an evidentiary hearing and that Hujo Noah was denied that ability or that opportunity, that right to an evidentiary hearing. And they, they used, uh, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they had five directives in the course of that very short decision that essentially said to the commission, thou shalt take these things into account during the course uh, from here on out. And I was surprised a little bit, uh, or maybe I shouldn't have been, that earlier today in the summaries, that there was an explicit mention of those. And, and again, am I correct here? There were five five directives that the, the committee, please I, come I, in. I will take your word on it. It's, it's bubbling through my mind now, but yes. Um, and, and HELCO 2, which was the result of Hu Honua's appeal, said, go back to the conditions that the court decided in Helco One, which was that we that we have a right to look at greenhouse gas emissions and a clean and helpful environment. Helco Two said there shall be an evidentiary hearing. So there are at least three components that have to occur. Um, and and Huho Nua still denies that a clean and helpful environment is anything more than greenhouse gases. Okay, I, I understand. I understand now. So, I mean, predictably, uh, it was predictable, I should say, what your position was going to be over the course of the hearing. So you made that very explicit. It was predictable what uh, Tahiri, Steve Pace, and Sandy Wong's position was going to be. Uh, it was pretty predictable what the uh, consumer advocate's position was going to be because they've been fairly consistent from, from my yes. perspective, right? Uh, and it was fairly predictable where who it was going to be and fairly predictable where Helco was going to be. Now, that said, uh, how much daylight did you see or did you perceive between the uh, ostensible partners on the, uh, the, the on one side being Huho Nua and Hawaiian Electric, Hawaii Electric Light Company? Did you see any daylight in the course of those evidentiary days of hearings and in terms of the questioning or the, the cross examine the, uh, the objections? Did you see any daylight between those two parties? You mean daylight being um, a separation in their views? Yes, yes. Differing opinions, differing uh, positions, subtle or otherwise. Hu Honua tried to over and over and over again say that the conditions in 2017 and the conditions in 2022 are identical. And therefore, there should be the same price impact between the two five-year separation. And the HECO was saying conditions, scenarios change from time to time with new facts coming in. This is important because in 2017, HECO said that Hu Honua would have a slight drop in rates, but the current projection is that Hu Honua will raise everybody's rates for 30 years. And so Hu Honua was trying to get HECO to say, but the conditions are identical over five years. Therefore, the rate impact should be identical. And HECO was like, no, the rates are going up. And the consumer advocate said, we did our own analysis. We took HECO's data. We put it into our models. And the rates are going up. So Huho Nua is trying to fight that. Because if we don't need new capacity, if we don't need new generation, if we've reached our RPS goals, then why should we adopt something that will raise rates? And that's really, I picked up on that as well. I mean, it's really kind of uh, goes to the bone. And I think that uh, in the, Mr. Mis, Mr. Knox is the attorney for the commission. He mentioned this as well, that, uh, you know, one of the consumer advocates 
top priorities is necessarily what the, what is the impact going to be of something like a possible new power plant on on the eighty five thousand plus Big Island ratepayers and beyond that, of course, you know the the people and the families of the ratepayers, right? Two hundred thousand or so uh, people on this island, and this notion uh, or assertion that if you approve this PPA as is, it's going to lead to people paying more on their Helco bill, which we're already paying a record amount here. You know, this is before we are seeing now price of oil in the world market in the $120 a barrel range, which we haven't seen in a long time. And we, I mean, we're already seeing record, record utility pricing here on this island uh, that has topped the record of September, 2009. I, I know something about this because I track it. So this is all before uh, possible uh, you know, substantial increases in, uh, in, in larger increases in oil. So do you think this is a, is it an argument over assumptions and methodology that, uh, I mean, who, who on his position essentially is, no, it's not, it's not going to raise rates. And were the, is that true they were attacking Hawaii Electric Lights Company assertions that there would be a, 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 a effectively a, an increase of people paying more to the to the utility? Yes, absolutely. And um, and also who who knew was trying to say that this temporary rise in the rate of oil will be stretched over 30 years. Now, if the price of oil reaches $150 a barrel and is maintained for 30 years, that's one thing. But if there's a momentary growth and it's a high rate, that does not translate to a 30 year change in, in the price of oil. Um, and, and so who Honua was trying to argue, and, and this was kind of funny, I thought, that one, we should use the absolute latest data possible for oil. And second, we should use the 2017 data for everything else. Um, and they were also upset that HECO ran different scenarios using different sets of inputs and coming out with different results. So they were saying, for example, if Hamakua Energy Partners is retired in one scenario in 2031 and is not retired in 2031 in a different scenario, somehow that is wrong. The utility should not be running all these different scenarios, yet they should be running different scenarios in Huhonua's favor which was, I think, kind of bizarre. Well, it sounds like uh, maybe a textbook definition of cherry picking to, yes. to, to at least some extent. You know, another thing I was, I've been trying to wrap my head around uh, is this notion that certain parties on this island who are in favor of a quantum leap forward as far as hydrogen production, H2 production. And some of these people I consider my friends and good folks. And it, it kind of surprised me when this came out sometime last year, when there was discussion of seemingly, uh, I, I think the phrase was preferential rates, that somehow you would have an independent power producer, such as Huhonua, which would be in, uh, under a con contractual uh, agreement with the utility company here, it's Hawaii Electric Light Company. And yet somehow you would have, there would be a one or more consumers of electricity on the island, which would not be right next door to Huho Nua, but would be somewhere else on the island, connected ostensibly via the wires that Hawaii Electric Light Company has, transmission distribution. And that that company could somehow work out a deal with Huho Nua to get preferential rates, which let's call it what it is, lower rates than the rest of us would pay uh, towards the somehow the societal good or the good of this island to produce hydrogen because well somehow they would deserve a lower rate because they're doing a good thing and they're they're meritorious they 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 merit getting a preferential rate and when I heard that and it still strikes me as is bizarre because then you could conceivably have all kinds of of individuals and companies making a similar pitch, raising their head saying, oh, I have an idea. If I had lower rates, I would be able to do ABC, it would be good for the Aina, it would be Pono, it would be ABC through Z, right? What, what, am I missing something here? No, you're exactly right. Huhonua is proposing that the 
cost of the plant be passed on to the ratepayers, and then for them to use excess energy to give a bargain rate to somebody else. And the other th point that is really important is there have been many years, over many years, there has been proposal to take Huna Geothermal Venture and create hydrogen. And the question is, why should Huhonua have that right and PGV not have that right? And if they both have the right, who gets to decide who gets it? And according to Helco, you cannot sell power to a third party. It's not written in the PPA, but it's been an assumed practice for decades. And here, who Honua was saying is, if it's not technically in the document, we're going to find a loophole. And I mean, uh, I think I'm correct in understanding that any such proposal for a preferential rate for one or more uh, other parties somewhere else on the grid would have to pass PUC muster review and muster right scrutiny. And unless, unless the wire went directly from Huhonua to the facility. But if the wire went directly, it would go through the shoreline management area and would trigger all sorts of other regulatory review. So, I mean, you know, Henry, uh, we're both into politics and, uh, you know, my, my PhD is in political science. So uh, I, I'd like to think that I have wherewithal to make the following observation. When you have very committed, uh, especially deep pocketed players, it's in their interest to find allies where they need to find allies. And in the case of uh, hydrogen, they found one and uh, effectively were able to get these particular individuals uh, to come out in favor then of Huhonua after there was this kind of, maybe it could be seen as a side deal or, or understanding that this is a priority for both parties. Therefore, if you do A, uh, A and B, C, I will support you moving forward with A, B and C or your, your, your plan in general. So it's, uh, it's just very interesting to see uh, see how, uh, how the world works in the real world uh, when you have very dedicated, very deep pocketed, uh, in this case, uh, 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 beyond Hawaii uh, financing and interest uh, that has been committed to, in a way that I've never seen before. And I've been in the energy game here now for decades, and I've never seen the type of uh, relentless, dogged determination and commitment on the part of any, any party, especially an outside party for so long a period. I mean, I could say that next year, I was certainly into it for several years. They gave it their all. They spent uh, you know, 100 million plus dollars when all is said and done for a losing uh, you know, battle that they lost. But they weren't in it for as long as Huhonua has been in it. And it's just, it's, it's striking to me how, how much these, uh, these parties uh, far from our shores so very much want this particular power plant to come online. Yes, um, this is by far the longest fight over a non-existent plant. So they proposed the plant in 2008. So we're in the 14th year. Um, and I can't, it, it boggles the mind because losers have tended to walk away after a couple of years. Winners have tended to get contracts after a couple of years. The fact that a project would last five years to bring a new project on and be fighting is, is long in terms of the PUC record, but 14 years definitely sets a record. Do you have any insight behind the, uh, that determination and that longevity, that resilience? You know, we talk about the, the grid being resilient, right? Well, uh, the folks at Huhonua, behind Huhonua, been able to enlist the likes of uh, Warren Lee, who I worked with uh, at ProVision. He was kind of the de facto manager at ProVision. I've known Warren for 22, going on 22 years, have a lot of aloha and gratitude towards him. John Miata and a number of other local heavyweights, you know, they've really pushed all the buttons possible, it seems to me, pulled all the levers possible to try to move this forward. And, uh, and now, like you said, what, 14 years later, it's still it's still ongoing and any idea why they've been at it for so long? Well, first, first, let me say, 
that we are totally focused on whether the project makes sense or not, and not the people. In fact, life of the land does not even rank candidates for administrative, judicial, or legislative appointment. We don't attend fundraisers. We don't get involved in politics. So our focus is entirely on the issue. And yes, we have known some of the players a long time too. We've been at the PUC for many decades. Um, and the only reason I can think of that they're going is as you say, they have extremely deep pockets. They have billion dollars behind them and they can have the money to fight this out for as long as they want to. Um, but it should sink or float based on a true listing of all the relevant facts and a fair and balanced review of those facts. You know, and even though this, this wasn't part of the proceedings, it wasn't part of the IRs, it wasn't part of the evidentiary hearings, to me, uh, kind of a, a supra, S-U-P-R-A, super question, and super as well, as far as I'm concerned, over this ongoing saga, uh, whether it's today, whether it's six months ago, whether it's several years ago, is I pose the question, is this really the best that we can do? The best that we can do in terms of power generation, specifically for this island? And of course, that that is a, uh, it, it brings up an, a response, which is, could be either quantitative or qualitative. And to me, it just seems uh, abundantly clear in, in answering my own question that this uh, clear cutting trees for decades on this island is uh, far from the best that we can do. And now it kind of brings me to another point I wanted to talk to you about. So, so much of what Kuho Nua's position has been, and they kept hammering away at this with witness after witness after witness after witness. After witness that their projections of uh, net savings of greenhouse gases, that uh, when all is said and done after the decades, it was going to make a positive contribution. And the, the, the fulcrum point here, if I understood correctly, was that they were gonna be planting trees, planting trees, planting trees, planting trees, planting trees. And how, how much confidence should we have in, in a commitment like that for, for any company to do uh, something like that over not just a year or two, but over 30 years. Their plan sounds marvelous. Their plan sounds like it's a winner, but walking the walk and talking the talk are very, very different things. Um, and for all of the fluff and and puff about their proposal for how many trees they're planting and what they're offsetting takes a lot of, of uh, yeah. assumptions that they're doing the right thing and that they will do the right thing. But you have to base it not on their fluff, but on the substance behind it. Look, clearing away the smoke and looking at the fire and seeing exactly what they're proposing. And we feel the evidence shows yeah, that I'm they sure. claim they'll plant a trees to offset, but it's that's it, just smoke and mirrors. Let me flesh out a little uh, of what you just said. So how is it smoke and mirrors? Is that essentially doubting their commitment to plant as many trees as they claim they would plant, or is it they, pl they would plant trees, but it wouldn't come anything close to the, yes. the, the sink, the carbon sink that they have been arguing strenuously month after month. That I can't disclose at the moment because we don't want to give Hu Honua any heads up on what's going to be in our final brief. Understood. Okay. All right. Well, uh, so I'm kind of segue to an interesting, uh, quite a long piece today in the Honolulu Star Advertiser by one of the reporters, uh, uh, Andre Gomes, who has written uh, a number of pieces on, on energy. And uh, he noted, uh, amongst other things, uh, 14 senators. So he was talking both about the evidentiary hearings, but also about various bills that have, uh, are being considered, were considered past or present tense in the Senate, at least. And I'm going to just read you a quote here. Uh, 14 senators have weighed in at the PUC, comma, criticizing a 2020 commission decision to reject a competitive bidding waiver and PPA with Hawaiian Electric. And the 
the point of me bringing this up is, wow, 14 senators, and we have four senators, four senators here on, on the Big Island. And uh, up until uh, Joyce and Buenaventura was elected uh, back in, uh, in 2020, there was uh, Russell Ruderman. And so he was one of our senators and a friend of mine for, for the you know, two previous sessions. So I don't think uh, Russell was on board with this group of 14. So I just find it interesting that uh, you had a, a clear majority of all senators in the state who uh, chimed in essentially implicitly in favor of Hu Honua's position. And I wonder if you have any commentary or observations uh, about that. Yes, the um, Hu Honua has always thought that if they have enough money and enough political connections that should trump facts and it should trump the um, rates and it should trump the environment. Here we're talking about climate change getting worse and worse. Here we're talking about the Senate saying that climate change is of, of the utmost importance. And here they're saying we should be chopping down trees and burning them for electricity. There is something not connecting up there. You can't burn down the lungs of the planet and be concerned about climate change. No, I think you, you put it about as uh, simply and concisely as, uh, as it can be. And uh, I know we're, we're wrapping things up here, but I just wanna, I wanna make clear in my own understanding that I get this right, because this was repeated by a number of the parties, uh, including yourself, Life of the Land. I mean, as far as what uh, Hawaii Electric Light Company has, as far as existing generation and the fact that PGV uh, is on the way, you know, week by week, month by month to, to come back to where they were prior to the eruption. And then if, if the revised and uh, amended and revised uh, restated PPA that's before the commission for PGV were to go into effect, which I, I, I support, that would allow PGB to go up from its uh, max right now of 38 megawatts, which I don't believe they've been anywhere close uh, since they went down, but they're somewhere 20, somewhere in the 20s, if I understand correctly. So they'd be going to 46 megawatts. It would be under a fixed contract, no longer avoided costs, which would be you know, great for everybody here. And then you've got two solar farms. One, uh, you can see very clearly driving from Waikoloa Village up going up to Malka that is well underway, and another one that is underway as well. Now, unfortunately, the one at Pulco, uh for 60 megawatts, they dropped out, but there was gonna be another round of bidding. So my point is, is that uh, from what I can tell, uh, we don't need another 20 plus megawatts of uh, a power plant up in Pippet Kale burning trees. So is, is that pretty much, is, is that a consensus amongst, uh, uh, amongst the, the parties? Without saying whether anybody supports going from 38 to 46 megawatts at, in Pune, um, and, and adding that we're repowering the Javi wind farm, and that in a few years, we're going to probably be repowering the South Point wind farm. And as you say, there's this third round coming up. Yes, the Big Island does not need energy. It does not need capacity. What it needs is to, to really reduce greenhouse gases and to really sharply lower rates. Those are the two key issues. Hu Honua does neither of them. They raise the rates to every person on the big island. And my take is that, uh, I mean, uh, all commissions, uh, I'd like to think, have had a very high priority on, on rate control, so to speak, minimizing the hit, the pain, on the ratepayer across the service territories that they regulate. But I'm struck, I can think particularly under this particular commission of uh, Jay Griffin, Jenny Potter and Leo Ascension, that they seem to have taken it to another level as far as the sensitivity and the concern they've shown about the impacts of, of any of their decisions on what ratepayers are gonna be paying, you know, that, that monthly bill. So, yeah, and again, especially uh, during these uh, difficult times as far as uh, changing fuel suppliers. Now that Parr mentioned or stated last week that they're going to move away from the Russian pipeline. And uh, despite any kind of softening attempts, PR attempts, 
I mean, I have to believe that that's going to lead to an increase. They're not going to be able to swap out probably dollar for dollar what they would have been paying the Russians. But anyway, that's another conversation. Well, my friend, Henry Curtis, uh, Life of the Land, you and Kat uh, just doing fantastic work uh, uh, regarding uh, Huhonua and other things that you guys have uh, uh, taken on over the months uh, and, and years and decades. So uh, much uh, aloha and thank you to you, Henry, for your time today. It's, uh, it's been uh, always, uh, always a pleasure. Thank you, Marco. Always great talking with you. Thank you. Ahui ho. Ahui ho. Thank you.